I'm really honored to introduce this conversation. It's between Lloyd Burnett, who's a client and uh, happens to be a black man. We've, we've been come friendly over the years. We've met in person several times, had drinks and had some fun together. And um, I really, really appreciate him. There's a mutual love and care and understanding. We had an incident, like uh, something, I posted something on social media that he got triggered by and he reached out to me and then we started to have a conversation about it. And then I said, hey, why don't we go on a call together, record it, and then see where this leads us and then share that conversation publicly. And I'm super grateful that he was willing to do that because I feel like we got something somewhere really good here we got really deep. There's some real serious pain going on in the world right now. A lot of suffering, right? And the only way that we move forward is by having these conversations openly, honestly, with love and compassion, right? We have to touch the pain. The only way the pain can heal is if we touch it. If we're willing to open up and share that pain and meet it with compassion. And that's what we got to do, guys. That's what we got to do to move this country forward. And so I'm super proud to and honored that Lloyd will let me be part of that and that, that we could get to do this together and that I get the, to share this with you. Because I think, I think there's a lot of people that when they see this, they're going to feel that some of that same pain and feel that same healing. So this is really an opportunity for all of us to heal together. We all need to heal in this situation. That's the only way that we move forward. So let's get into the conversation. And thank you so much for being part of that healing. I really appreciate that you are. We each have our own gift to give and yours is unique. What reality you want to create? It's your choice, always. No one can take that from you. Lloyd, my man. Oh, what's going on, Calvin? It's so good to see you. Good to see you too. So nice to see you. How's everything going? Um, things are going well. Yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been good times. It's been tough times. It's been very interesting times. Um, I, I, <laughs> yeah, same here. Kind of just yeah. like take it each day as it comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trying to understand the world together. And exactly. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> different, very different, you know, backgrounds and experiences. Where did you actually grow up? Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Gotcha. In all the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And yeah, it's, it's interesting because like I'm having now, I'm like remembering a lot about my childhood and I'm having to really investigate a lot of the beliefs that I had in childhood and the beliefs that I have now. And I remember one thing that I realized when I went to college is that I always thought that my town was predominantly black. And I, if somebody had asked, asked me in college, like I would have said, yeah, my town is like 90% black. And mm -hmm. somebody once called me on it and they were like, look at the census information. I looked at it and it's like 70% uh, white and like 30% mm -hmm. black. And I was like, how is this possible that mm -hmm. you know, my experience was just with black right. people? But, uh, you know. Was that the neighborhood and the schools and all of that? It was yeah. like. It was just really family. segregated really segregated um, right. even and when was this was that the 80s what are we talking the 90s yeah i'm born in 82 so gotcha. yeah whenever I, whenever those years were so but like yeah. now i've been really just kind of sitting with a lot of things that i've experienced and reflecting on it and just trying to understand what is true for me now mm -hmm. um and it's been so how does it, what does that mean to you to realize, like, how does that feel to realize that, oh, I thought it was like almost ex entirely black and it's not? Yeah, it just means that I, I um, well, I felt, I realized that in college and I remember feeling really confused and also really sad that like I didn't experience the diversity of my mm. town. That it was so segregated that, mm -hmm. you know, I was only around uh a lot of people who looked like me and and that was it and yeah um if there was like a, a sadness around it and also like an anger that like uh that 
you know, we're still so separated. And I was talking to my mom and she was telling me that when she was looking for a house, my mom's from Germany um, and she moved over and my dad was in the military and it's like one of the classic couples of uh, American military, black American military man meets a German woman. My mom's actually half and half. Her mother is white from Germany, father's black American military. Wow. And so Wow. Yeah, so two generations of it. And so my mom's half and half and she moved to the States with my dad and she was telling me while like at the beginning of all of this uprising that she was calling to find an apartment for us. And out of 10 places, like eight of them said directly asked her on the phone, are you black? And mm-hmm. she was like, well, I'm half and half. And the majority of them outrightly said, well, we can't have you in our building because everybody else would move out. And then other ones, they were just mysteriously not available anymore. And yeah, just really interesting kind of experiences that, you know, my family's reminding me of and that I'm remembering because I thought that I had transcended this whole race thing. Right, right. Kudos, by the way, to that one landlord for at least being freaking honest about it, right? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. As bad as that is, but like, yeah. I agree 100%. It's like, I mean, own it. Just just own it. Like, I mean, I really believe that we all have. And it's interesting because like, it didn't sound like that landlord himself or herself, just speculating here was like racist. It wasn't about that for, for that person. It was like an economic issue, right? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, an economic issue fueled by by racism, you know. Right, by, by expectation of other people's racism, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah, right. I don't... Yeah, yeah. Thing on the phone, that landlord was like, you can't move in because I don't like you because you're black and... Right, you know, right, yeah, yeah. But, that, yeah. I mean, that's just an interesting, like, you know, example of, like, how this kind of thing can work, right? So it's not that there's a... It's not that there is a... a a rule against it or a law against it or anything like that. It's more like, well, you know, (laughs) for my sake, if I'm to survive in business here as a landlord, right, this is, you know, and then people not having the moral convictions to be like, I don't care. Like that's, that's the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. And I think there's a, a deeper energy to that too, that kind of, I feel like it pervades everything that's going on right now. And that's, from human to human, if you truly value a human, then you'll most likely want to treat them with love and compassion and typically do things to support them on their journey. But it's like, in that case, it was like, you can't move in here because, you know, my financial interests are going to be at stake and everybody's going to move out and I, I can't have that. And it's just like, from human to human, like, I feel like if you valued the other life and the other experience, then you would be willing to start doing that investigation work right there and think about it. And it's like with the George Floyd thing, um, like, I don't think that cop set out to to be like, you know, I'm going to kill a black person today. Or I don't even think right. the cop probably consciously believes that he's racist. But it's it's the fact that he was able to kneel on another man's neck as if he were stepping on a cockroach. And that is a a sense that a lot of black people have that there our lives aren't valued. And so there's more of a willingness to do things to hurt us, whether it's conscious or not, but there's a, a lack of fully seeing the, the humanity of another person because yeah, I do believe that if George Floyd were another color, were white or even one of the model, what they call model races, that mm. there may have been more of a human response rather than mm-hmm. not truly seeing the humanity in a person because you can't sit on someone like that if you don't connect to their humanity. Like that would be impossible to... Right. Yeah, so... Yeah. I, I mean, that's a, it's a, that's a good, it's a good question, right? Because like I... I obviously know don't know the answer and, and and I'm not I'm not disputing what you're saying, but one of the things that fascinate me is is the assumptions the assumptions that we make, right? Like that if you're like 
I expect him to be to be racist, then you that could lead you to see racism. Where, like, where, like I look at it, I'm like, I honestly, I have no idea what's going through this guy's mind, right? Clearly, like he, it seems like he ne- needs to do some work. There's some like he's he's angry, scared, probably, right? There's some some like stuff going on there that would cause him to do that. But I'm not like my mind doesn't go to oh, it has to be race, racist, racist, racially motivated, right? But it, it might, it might be, right? I just don't, I just don't know. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And those things, they're hard to know, easy to assume, but it's, I mean, if you just look at the history of human behavior, um, and if we look at specifically uh, African-Americans, black people in the United States, starting with slavery, Mm -hmm. people brought over here in a less than human form um, and treated as as human. And the same people that created that system that treated one type of person as less than human uh, built the the country and the laws and the systems. And... I'm not saying that, I, I mean, I don't know if, you know, the founding fathers were sitting there and be like, we're going to screw the black people, you know, I don't know. But there's just this energy of less than human. And so mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter what happens to them or um, it's easy to kill them or easy to make them do things that, that, that hurts them, just like as if they were cockroaches or flies, you know? Right. And do you think, I mean, do you think that's still the case? Yes, who 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 would you say feels this way towards black people? All white people, Asians, black people themselves, like who and how yeah. widespread? Yeah, I would say it's pretty widespread and I don't wanna say all white people or all whatever because um, there are people who are doing their work and I'm witnessing that more and more. Uh, that's one of my beliefs that is like cracking open right now during investigation. Mm-hmm like all white people hate black people. Like I'm seeing some incredible acts of like courage and solidarity. Um, But I think the image of a black man specifically has been painted in a way that most people who see those popular images through films, through media, through whatever, have some sort of fear of them. And so when they have that fear and also less than human, if we think of like, you know, one of the first blockbusters, the a birth of a nation where, you know, you have the white face, uh, the white actor painted black face and he's the savage, the beast right. who preys on the white woman and wants, wants to rape the white woman and whatever. And that's the image that has been instilled uh, about black men, that they're savages, they're beasts, they're to be feared. When, if you actually look at the times, who was raping who in those times, it was the black right. women, slave women right. who were being raped. But that image has continued. In what way? Because I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't grow up in this country, so I don't know. I watched uh, Netflix, uh, it's not on Netflix, but the documentary the 13th, or maybe it's a Netflix documentary, I don't know. But I watched that the other day, right? And and they talk about birth of a nation and, and that whole thing. But you know, I'd never, I'd never seen it before. Is that something that people see grow? Like, is that part of people's growing up today or like being seen in schools or? No, not that, that film, but that oh. archetype of the black person. That is, uh, black people are typically criminals in, in uh, movies or servants. This is changing a lot. Right. When right. I saw myself on TV growing up, I was a criminal. I was on cops. I was being apprehended like right so that's an interesting point right so so what like how much is is that like your own self-image and and like not you necessarily specifically right but we all know that that like what we what we believe to be true about ourselves we tend to you know it shapes our behavior our actions so how much of this is like in your head versus in other people's heads and how how does that work Uh, it's a beautiful question and um it's something that a lot of people, I feel like this is the work that a lot of people aren't willing to do right now, their own right. influence on the creation of their reality. And I do mm-hmm. believe um, some of it is is in our heads as well. Right. Like, for an example, the, I 
now it's not even consciously, it's automatic. When I'm walking on a street and there's a white woman, um, I will typically go to the other side of the street and I won't even right. think about it. Um, I was I've, heard, to- I've heard other, other black people like in New York say similar things, right? I just don't want to get in it, like even remotely be accused of having done anything wrong or like being, exactly. being threatened and like, you know, cause a scene. And so just, you know, yeah. I mean, nothing happened in the physical reality. Like that was all playing out in my head. I mean, Uh, granted, there's, I've seen a lot of evidence of what could happen, but that was my own like reenactment of what could possibly happen that could be caused by racism. So absolutely. Like, I remember seeing years ago, there's like some social study that said that like they gave a a group of, of, um, of students a test it's like a standard kind of school type of test and then they had two groups right and and one group just got the test and the other group got the test but before the test was an, another question added which was what's your race or ethnicity right black caucasian asian whatever and then people black kids scored worse when they were made aware of their race mm. before taking the test right so just bringing that frame in oh i'm black therefore i'm stupid therefore i'm less good at school right that to me is like that breaks my heart that breaks yes. my heart yeah absolutely and it's it, it's part of a I don't know. I don't know if I want to use the word conditioning that we experience, but that's the word that's coming to me right now. A conditioning right. that we experience that we're less than, that we're not good, and that's because we see ourselves growing up on TV as the help, the right. people who don't speak English well, the people who don't succeed, the people right. who don't get to college, the people who end up in jail. So, right. of course, growing up, we're going to have that in our minds, and it's not conscious. It's just that's what right. we see, and right. so. Yeah, it's like, and that's part of the idea of privilege is like, there's extra work on the plate of many black people to have to unwind. Everybody has their own work, but around success, there's extra work that we have to undo all of these stories that we've been taught about ourselves that just, I mean, they're not inherently true. They're just stories. So... And what, so, I mean, that's beautiful and it's like hard, right? It's super hard. And it's like, you know, you can do it individually and that's hard. And then like, how do you do that sort of at scale, um, right? Massive thing. On that note, like what, what I've, I've heard a lot of like, you know, Uncle Tom or Oreo and like, you're not, you know, <laughs> right black or something like that. Like what, where does that, how does that work? How does that play in? Ugh. You were like bringing back the memories. I can't right. tell you how many times that like it was so hard growing up because I didn't, me personally, I had a hard time fitting in with mm. uh, a lot of the black people uh, starting when I left. I went to a boarding school for the last two years of high school and then I went to an Ivy League university and I had a hard time finding my place in the black community and I had a hard time. It was impossible to find my place really in the white community. Um, it, in my mind, it felt impossible. Uh, I'll say right. that. Um, and yeah, I got called um, all of those names and it's part of the socialization that we experience that we are not good enough. And so when we see someone who, um, you know, is doing things that aren't associated uh, with being black, then there's a name calling. There's a, yeah. yeah, But I feel like as a people, we're right now, um, and we have been coming out of uh, kind of a victim mentality, coming Mm -hmm. out of this socialization that we're bad. And it's like, it's it's not just showing white people and supporting white people and doing the work around racism. We're doing the work ourselves because, I mean, I remember getting, I got stuck in Harlem once a long time ago. And in my mind, it's like, there's lots of black people and I'm not that type of black person. I don't know if I'm going to fit in. I don't know if I'm going to walk right. And I was scared. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I was scared. Basically. I don't know if I'm going to walk right. Yeah. If I can play the part. Right. 
You know, it's like I've been shown so many images of people who look like me um, that are scary. And so right. I've also learned to fear people who look like me. Fuck. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really the image that has been painted, painted of a black man is a scary image. And it's so yeah. sad that this has happened because I am a black man and I know how beautiful black men are as human beings. And I know how safe and how loving we are. Like my father, my brother, uh, my black friends and everything. But I still have in my mind from all of these images, the war on drugs, nightly news, seeing black people being arrested in prison. And it's like, of course I'm gonna have that in my mind that, yeah. that black people are dangerous just like white people have it in their mind. Yeah. I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes, man. I'm feeling yeah. chills. This is this is painful. This is deep. This is deep, deep pain. It, it really is. And yeah. and it's it's our work as a human race to continue unpacking this and to do the work to unlearn the things that we learn and to begin consciously living from the place that we want to to live. And there's something that's urgent right now. It's like we have the spiritual aspect where as a collective, we have to do this work to unlearn the things that we learned. And then there's also the short-term work, which is mm -hmm. fixing the systems that are in place that are urgently, disproportionately harming Black men, people of color. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to do this deep work. And I think right now in the short term, it's important to begin reforming some of these systems. I know in our back conversation, we talked about systemic racism and systemic right. opp oppression. And I think that it's important right now to start working on some of uh, those things and do the healing work at the same time. Right. So, so tell me about that. Like what, what are those sy systems or systemic things that you see and that you've experienced or that you see? Yeah, well, I mean, think back to 13th does a really good job of highlighting this, of how the wealth gap was created between, um, between races. So it's basically bringing in uh, more funding to uh, black neighborhoods. Well, so, so let's, but let's, talk, let's talk for a minute about like the systems um, first and like the the get a little more specific on that so I, I can understand it. Cause like, I, yeah, I see 13, like, I think the, the main case that they make is, you know, um, prison population. Um, yeah. There's a lot more detail to it. Right. But that's sort of the narrative that goes through. Um, yeah. So like, what are you seeing there? What are you, what are you seeing that, that are systems that are harming, harming black people? It, and the thing is, uh, I don't have the specific data on this. It's no, no, more, but uh, just your experience, your take on it. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not trying to gotcha or anything. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, it's um, loans and getting jobs. Um, mm -hmm. I do know that I did. I don't know if it was in 13th or something else that I just saw. Uh, no, it was in a video on systemic oppression. Uh, I don't remember the specific, specific data, um, but uh, a resume with a black name is right. X amount of times less likely to get a call back than a name, uh, with a white name. So, so just on some of those, right? So, so what I've seen is like, I mean, discriminating based on, on race for loans is illegal, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but, but it, it is illegal. I don't know. I don't know if it happens or to what extent it happens, but it's definitely illegal. I did, I did see something about that study about the, the, the last names. And what I saw was that it was, it was not, it was a, not a race thing. It's actually a class thing that mm -hmm. certain names denote it like, you know, lower class or, or, you know, poor folks, which is, yeah. Uh, that's pretty much married to race in the United States. Um, the idea that black people are poor and you're going to tell me that like 
if, you know, Tom Smith, um, like you can't really tell if that is uh, about class or if he's rich or poor. Right. If the name is ethnic sounding, it's associated with right. being poor. Right. Yeah, I'm just, the, the reason I'm curious about that is like, because there's obviously poor people of other races too, right? And, and the more the more we can unite and just be like, hey, these are problems, doesn't matter if you're white or black or yellow or brown or whatever you are, but these are problems and let's, let's address them. The more we can unite and help and come together to solve them, right? Uh, yeah, that's, I think I hear you and, and I struggle with that one because it's kind of the idea of equality versus equity. And because of a lot of the practices that are legal, um, but they're harmful to a specific group of people, because those practices have been in play for such a long time, there's a gap between right. people. So if we say that we're all equal, well, you know, this person is actually starting from back here and this person right. is starting here. So we have to give a bit more help to the other right. person. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's obviously, it's obviously true that there is that, 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 um, I completely agree that like, you know, <laughs> kind of like, um, black people overall are not starting from the same like start position, right? Like been, 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 there's been, there has been, there's been slavery, there's been racism, there's been racist policies for years and years. Like, I think, what was it? Some of this stuff got like, kept going redlining up, to, up till the early eighties or mid eighties or something like that. Right. So, so clearly there, there are, there are consequences of these, past policies today even if the policies themselves don't exist i don't think yeah i don't think there's any question about that and then yeah the, then the question becomes okay so now what do we do right yeah and i hear you and i know that my lane is the lane of supporting people and going inward to begin dismantling the human aspect of the policies and right. the things that have been in, in place. The actual policies, what we need to do going forward, I really don't know. No, no. I no, I, 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 I don't think it's, I don't think there's any, there are any, you know, easy answers or, or, you know, simple solutions. The, the, my worry would be right that that if we don't properly address the the inside forces right the the you mentioned victim victim mentality or like that self image and those things then you kind of you can pile on as much money as you want it ain't it's not really going to make a difference right? um, but it gives a little bit of breathing room to to do that work it's like when people are starting a job if they have i mean starting right. a business if they have some savings they have a bit more breathing room to do that work it may it may right or it may just give them more time to not not do the work i'm not i'm not saying either way like we've the one of the things i was like i, I saw this stuff, like we've had war on poverty for for decades right piling yeah. millions of dollars into eradicating poverty and it hasn't worked right because i don't think like it doesn't seem like just putting money into it actually changes because i mean there's a reason why why people are poor that are poor and if we don't address those reasons whether it's you know mindset mental structural whatever it is then just putting money on it is not solving it yeah, it's a shaky foundation where, yeah, the money yeah. doesn't really do it. I hear you. Yeah. yeah, how do we? I feel like that's where minds like you come into place figuring out <laughs> right. what, like the structure of yeah. doing this massive internal work right. uh, of the planet. Because I agree, it's the most important part. It's like right. if we don't shift this, then then it's really difficult to build something sustainable on top that looks like yeah. what we want it to look like. Yeah, I mean, it, it is that is that is the thing that excites me. That that I don't know if you know this, but like in, I have this dream of being a special advisor to the president yeah, of the United yeah. States. You yeah. see me talk about that? Uh huh. Yeah. You so, told me like, about 
We had dinner together and you told oh, me about Oh, right. It. I told him about it over dinner. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. So, yeah. So, it's, it is something that I thought a lot about and that, like, having that spiritual teacher component combined with the engineer's mindset, which is just, like, looking at the facts and the data and the systems and, like, you know, what we can do there. And then the entrepreneurial kind of making changes, I, you know, hope that I can make a difference in this, right? But it, it, it's, it's hard. Um, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. And I, I mean, and the, I mean, the engineer in me is like, oh, it's easy, <laughs> right? Yeah. But then, but then there are people, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious about what your experience of of racism has been in in the United States. What have you witnessed? Like when you hear people talking about racism, especially between black and white people, like what do you see as like someone coming from Denmark in the United States? I think what I see is that we make things about race when it's not helpful. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, like the George Floyd, Floyd thing is a good example. Like I, I follow people on the left and the right of politics. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I follow, listen to all the sources for two days. Everybody were united. Like people on the right were just as outraged as people on the left. Right. White people were just as outraged as, as black people or any other skin color and then it became about race and then we're just divided again mm. right? and the, and and again i'm not saying it wasn't about race but there was no we had no evidence there was no it was not it wasn't and, and, and we don't need we need don't need it to make it about race to be outraged at it and to be like this we need to, to do better here yeah 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 i hear you i hear you and yeah, it's hard for me to pull race out of that situation, out of the George Floyd uh, situation. And it could be, you know, because like I've been all of the conditioning that I've received and, but it's, it's hard to believe that he would do that, that cop would do that to another white person. Right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, and that's interesting because like, to me, I just see a sick person. I just see a hurt, a hurt person, right? Yeah. Only a hurt person would do this. He's hurting, whatever it was. I mean, so there's a famous or semi-famous, I guess, Danish photographer. He's, he's old now. I think it's like late seventies, eighties. He, his name is Jacob Holt. Mm-hmm. He did a bunch of travel in the U S back in the day, um, like way back and took pictures, it was called American Pictures. And he, so he would travel, he would just like bum around the country, like hitchhiking. And like, he ended up, he ended up meeting with the president and with like all kinds of, you know, you know, big people. But he would just like travel around, like stay at, at people's homes, mostly mostly poor people, black people, take pictures of it. And it became a, a, a slideshow. One of the things that he said that, that stuck with, I saw him give a, give a presentation in Copenhagen some years ago. And he said, the KKK, there was, they were active back then, they're the small racists. Mm-hmm. Every time he'd hitch a ride with someone who was a, member, a clan's member, he'd sit there, and he's a preacher's son. He's like out of six generations of preachers. Um, and he'd like drive for like six hours. Every single time they would break down in tears and they would tell of their story of abuse, how they'd been hurt. And... Yeah. Once they open up to that wound, they took off the mask. They stopped hurting other people. Right. When we're able to feel that humanity, of course. Right. Yeah. I don't think that people commit racist acts or become Ku Klux Klan members because they're inherently evil. They've had life experiences um, that have been hurtful and they're hurting right. and they're lashing out out of pain. I mean, if we look at racism, the core of what it is, it's, it's a fear. It's a, it's a, it's a pain. It's a hurt that once we're able to dive into that pain and really feel it, it no longer begins to seep out unconsciously into our behaviors and into our actions. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. In that work, it's like, that's the work that I call it the pop, that moment when somebody can 
feel something that has been really controlling their thoughts, their beliefs, their actions, and they see it, and then there's a pop. And then from that day forward, it's so much easier for them to, to maneuver in, in life. And if we could have a massive pop on, the, right. you know, on this planet, then yeah. we would act from more love than from, from pain. Yeah. yeah, I believe that. I think that's the thing that needs to happen more than anything, right? That's yeah. that popping stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the Derek Chauvin, I think that's his name. Um, like, I believe that he thought that he was doing the thing that he needed to do. Like, he thought that he was doing the best thing that he needed to do. That's what he needed to do. Possibly, and, yeah. Or I would, I, I'm not sure he's thinking in that moment, right? I think he's just, he's reactionary. But I, I mean, yeah. But it's like a survival of right. what I need to do right, right. now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I understand what you're saying now. Like, yeah, he need, he did what he felt he needed to do for his safety. Is is that what you're saying? Exactly. Or for the like, you look at. I mean, this where um, <laughs> exaggerated example, but you look at like Hitler. It's like he truly believed in his vision. He yeah. truly believed in that he had to do all of this to save humanity. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like I'm smiling. People, they're not good. No, I'm just smiling because there's a there's a, a black rapper over in in the UK that I that I you know follow on Twitter and I I talk to him. I'm actually talking to him tomorrow, but he's like he made this Twitter post was like maybe the reason that Hitler was so angry is because of all those time travelers from the future zipping back and trying to kill him. <laughs> I was just like. I cracked up. <laughs> oh Jesus! Yeah, yeah. It's like, no. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like these people—they truly believe that they're doing whatever they need to do to save themselves or to save right. humanity. And like, yeah. I think that we need to, like, that healing work that we've been talking about will address the unconscious, mostly unconscious idea that black people are dangerous. Right. As when we believe yeah. that they're dangerous, we have to like make sure that they don't hurt anybody. Right. Because a white yeah. woman, if a white woman had a twenty dollar check, like he wouldn't inherently believe that the white woman was dangerous <laughs> and that she needed even if she punched him, I mean, I don't know if this is true, this is what I'm guessing would happen. Even if she was right. punching and swinging, like I'm sure he would have been like, Come on, honey, let me he may have thrown her around a little bit, but no knee to the neck, you know, because there's no either conscious or subconscious belief that this other is dangerous and a threat. Mm -hmm. And black yeah. men have always throughout time been looked at as a threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <sighs> yeah. I had, yeah. So one one thing there too is like the media, right? The media, like the the the. It it feels like there's kind of feels like the media is not on our side, right? <laughs> I agree with that. Because like there is, yeah. It's just like fixate on that thing. Like like there. I mean, there's so many things around that situation. that are like you know. And again, not to excuse anything, because like what happened was absolutely horrible, right? But as, as far as I know, the three other cops was black, Asian, and Hispanic, right? So like multiple races here. And apparently there's like a whole long thing that had led up to this, right? Like he'd been running away, they'd been trying to pin him down, they have been running away again, and there's, I forget the details, but like all that stuff that had led up to it. And also they apparently, presumably knew each other for like 10 years the cop and, and george yeah. floyd and they'd work together right so like it, again it's like we like it who knows who knows what was really going on there and and why that escalated in that way the only thing that that i feel pretty confident of is like that that yeah a it was terrible and that that b Derek was not in his right mind right um mm -hmm. yeah. none of them were none of them were yeah. Yeah. 
but then but then my i guess the, the point i was trying to make there is just like the media f- focuses on the thing like you know the thing that makes it the most divisive and then keeps running that and then it like spreads on social media and then like all that yeah it gets worse yeah i feel that i feel that and and i agree that the the media is kind of throwing gas on the flames you know because that's what sells and that's how they make their money but yeah i just it's just hard for me to believe that that he those cops wouldn't be in their right mind if it had been a white woman like that fear response well, I, mean, I think there's a the white woman sure like there's there's i think there's something that happens between men and women where a, a man automatic like pretty much automatically goes into protective mode right and and we know that women tend to be weaker and all that but let's say a white man you know right maybe right um and i, I yeah not denying it but but i i hear you you told me something interesting in the in the video which is like that your experience with cops changed after you something changed inside of you. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I after talking to you and saying that like I began to unpack that with a with a friend and and it's absolutely true that like I in the past what 20 years I, maybe i got a stop sign ticket and i did run the stop sign uh, <laughs> <laughs> i actually beat it in court even though i ran the stop sign <laughs> nice. oh, i have but, a ticket i take it for a, for running a red light light on a bicycle in manhattan i was supposed oh to go to court go to court like a week ago but because of covid it's all <laughs> oh boss. i'm going to dispute it i've never been through a trial for it traffic tickets so i'm like in, in denmark you can't do that it's just like pay up right but here you can actually contest it so i'm gonna try to see what happens it's super easy to do it because the majority of the time the cops don't show up and if they don't show right. up you're- that's, what I, that's what I heard too <laughs> that's how i want <laughs> <My ticket. laughs> nice. um, then i heard that you just request the jury trial <laughs> <laughs> and then they're gonna like, fuck it that ain't happening <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's how you get off. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my experience, like I haven't experienced any violence or brutality from the police. I haven't experienced any like violence from uh, white people. I have experienced some like subtle things that like I looked at and I, I believe that they were racist. And so I was... I led myself to believe that I had done all of this internal work and that I was in this place where I just, you know, just don't really attract that energy. And I mean, that may be true to a sense, but also what I realized is that I changed myself a lot, that Mm -hmm. I went to uh, a private, it started with the private boarding school that I went to and I began to act differently. I began Mm -hmm. to talk differently consciously to fill in, mm-hmm. to fit in, mm-hmm. um, cut my hair in a certain way, um, emphasize my gayness more than my blackness, mm. and I made myself safe to everybody. Mm. That's why uh, people aren't uh, as prone to be violent with me, uh, because right. I've changed myself. And it just makes me so sad to think that I changed myself so that I would be safe. Like, mm. I I make sure when my hair, uh, this coronavirus not being able to get a haircut has been really tough for me. I just finally got a haircut yesterday uh, <laughs> after three sure. months. Um, I This was also what helped me realize having an Afro made me so nervous going into the streets. Mm. One, because... Um, yeah, this idea that uh, people are going to uh, think that I'm dangerous or something like that. And two, mm-hmm. because uh, I've been taught through, I've learned, I'm not going to say I've been taught, I've learned through all of the images that I've seen in the world that straight hair is better. And so I feel ugly when I have mm-hmm. an afro. And so it's not being able to cut my hair has really made me sit and think how I have really disassociated or distanced myself from my blackness. Mm. Um, 
to survive. What it's, it's what parts of me thought I had to do to survive. Um, and it's just, it's just fucking sad. To th- I cried for days thinking about this, that like I deluded myself into believing that I did so much internal work that I don't tra- attract, you know. Right. Uh, it's like, yes, that may be true, but I also change myself to be who I think people want me to be so that I can be safe. Interesting. And you feel less you now than, than when you were the other way? No. Um, Less authentic? I feel like I've found a way to be authentic in who I am. And like now that uh, I know why I've changed a lot of things, it makes it kind of easier to stomach because I I understand it and it makes it more authentic for me now. Now it's, Mm -hmm. if I'm choosing to get my hair cut every week, I'm not going to lie to myself and I'm going to say just because I have the means to do it and I like the way that it looks and everything, I'm going to tell myself the full truth that right. I'm afraid that people won't think that I'm sexy if I have an Afro and I'm afraid that people will think that I'm dangerous if I have an Afro. I'm just right. telling myself the truth now. And so that helps me be a little more authentic with yeah. what I'm doing because I'm still choosing to do the same changes that I did. Right. It's interesting, like, the, the thing I hear also past the sadness is that, that like, the, like, there's a choice, like, you made a choice, right? Like, well, these are, this is how society works. These seems to be, seem to be the rules, right? This is just given perceptions and people's views on quote unquote blackness or whatever you would, you would call that, right? All right, if I want to play the game, and when here are the things I can do. So there's, there's a positive message, you know, in like, you know, here's there are things that, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like, here are the things I, I, I didn't choose any of like how I was born, where I was born, how like any of that stuff that happened around me, but I have a choice of what I do. Right. I can choose how I, how I respond. I can choose my actions. Right. So there's at least that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I, I I hear you. I am celebrating the, the fact that I did make those conscious choices to to be right. you know successful, and I chose those. But damn it, it really hurts to 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 see that I chose to de-emphasize a really important part of me. Um, right. th- that is what I believed needed to be de-emphasized to have the success right. that I've that I've had. Yeah. So. Do you, do you then like, I mean, obviously your hair, you're not going to grow out your hair in the, on the weekends, but like, do you then like kind of take off the, the mask or the guards and, in, in, you know, when you hang out with certain groups of friends or in certain communities or is it more permanent thing? It's more permanent. Yeah. Uh, and well, I mean, I feel like I have, yeah, just different identities with different people. Like, um, mm-hmm. I talk different with my family or, you know, Mm. my black friends and I talk with my gay friends or my white friends or, you know, my Moroccan friends here. Uh, So it's just kind of different identities that I have assumed. And I think the most important thing for me right now is understanding why I'm assuming those identities. I'm not judging myself for doing it or making myself need to change or whatever, but just knowing the truth. I deserve to know the truth of why I behave the way that I behave. And I think when we know the truth of why we behave the way we behave, then that opens up a fertile ground for us to choose our own reality and choose a reality based on love. And that goes back to that deeper work that we've been talking about. Yeah. giving people the actual possibility to choose because right, right now they're just reacting from pain and from illusions and stories. Yeah. 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 We've, we've had, we've had conversations internally on the, on the team and the company, right. And like there are people, we have people, we have 35 people now. So obviously not everybody sees things the same way. Right. And so like some have cops as family members and you know, they're getting harassed and they're like, scared because like you know right then they, you see stories with like pizza being with glass shards being served to cops and like all that kind of stuff right and like most of them are out there trying to 
help right and try to make make things better but but and that's that's one of the things that i find so sad too is like that if you look at crime stats obviously like black people commit way more crime right more murders everything um so clearly there is like going to be a stereotype there right and black people are being told that cops are evil brutalizers that are out to murder them like how's that relationship gonna work right <laughs> it's just Exactly. And I want to clarify with the statistics, too, that um, it's important to understand why Black people are uh, uh, constitute uh, the majority of whatever the statistic is, the majority of crime. It's like we've been put in pressure cookers, uh, like in places where funds have been cut off where uh, infrastructure has not been renewed or invested in. And of course, that's, that's fertile ground, whatever color people are, that's fertile ground for various types of, of crime. And so it's like, yeah, there is a lot of crime. There is a lot of black on black crime. There is a lot of black on white crime, black on whatever crime. But right. we have to like look at why. Like right. It's really important to understand why. For sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, that's, that's again, that, again, something that I, with everybody that I see and follow left or right, everybody's interested in that question, right? Like why and what, what can we do about it? What actually, what's actually going to work to address that? Because I don't think anybody wants that. Exactly. Exactly. Did you grow up, so one of the things that I hear a lot on that, on that topic is fatherlessness, like, kids growing up without a father at home, which did you, your father, your parents were together, your upbringing? Yes, they were together in my upbringing uh, the majority of the time. And um, yeah, like I had, my father was absent for a while due to drug addiction. He was addicted to crack for a uh, mm -hmm. year. Um, so yeah. Um, what exactly was the question was? No, just like what, like what, so, I mean, that's another topic that I hear coming up a lot, like, you know, crack it, epidemic, and especially in black communities, right? And, um, but no, like the, the, the number of kids, black kids growing up without a father in the household. Yeah. What, do, do, what are the statistics that, that you saw of this? I'm curious because I just was having this conversation today with- So Harry. what I've seen was it was like four out of five kids the the storyline that I've that I've heard from someone like Larry Elder that's like his he he says that a lot like I think it's like four out of five black kids grew up with a father like with mm -hmm. both their parents mm -hmm. before welfare and then welfare happened and then single mothers got more money if there's no father in the home and that led to you know now one in five, only one in five black kids grow up with both parents in the household um and that and then and like when you when it what's that and also mass incarceration right right yeah so yeah so a, a lot of these you know fathers are in jail right yeah absolutely and that then those kids that grow up without a father then they look for another father figure someone to look up to and then they get into to, to crime and drugs and gangs and other things and then like we just have this this vicious cycle absolutely absolutely yeah and I mean, thank goodness that's not the the route that I choose to take to channel the the pain that I was experiencing from having, you know, an absent right. father for a certain amount of time. Like my father right. is in my life now, and and a really incredible man. Um, right. But uh, yeah, not all of us are able to or willing to channel the energy in that way. You know. No. Yeah, and I, I, for me, if if that's to the extent that that's true, I, I don't, I I don't know. But what really saddens me about that is that that pattern of or that that like we want to do well, so we do welfare, and then we end up causing more harm. Yeah. Right. Um, and that man, that just I mean, that crushes me, right? Because that because then then we like oh crap now we've have an even bigger problem let's do more of the things that we mean well by but which end up having the opposite effect of what we wanted right and that, i i think that happens a lot in government i agree it happens a lot I and agree. then 
It's like, <laughs> great. This cost a lot of money that people could have kept for themselves, right? Not paid in taxes. And we just made everything much worse. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't have the mindset to figure out what it is that needs to be done that, that won't backfire in, in that sense, you know, but it, it, you're right. It happens quite a bit. And I'm sure that there's been a lot of um, kind of negative aspects to welfare or to other um, actions or policies that were implemented to, to help groups of people, just like, yeah. you know, the war on drugs, like right. that, <laughs> that was something yeah. that backfired. It was to help people to get I mean, drugs. That, that's another thing for that for me as a Dane, because like, Danes are not on drugs to the extent that Americans are like across races and, and like, all, like across the side, like here, here, like it's, it's people smoke pot over the, all over the place. Right. And like, you know, hang out with people and then they do co- cocaine and they do like whatever. I'm like, what's wrong with you people that you're so busy trying to get away from your fucking selves. Right. <laughs> you know? Like there must be so much pain. There's like, there's something that's happening that, in the cultural psyche that people really can't be with themselves. They need, I mean, that's what drugs are for, right? It's escape from, from your, your reality for being present, intimate with yourself. Yeah. And like that breaks my heart too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so we we need you to come up with that mass structural (laughs) process where we could like start manufacturing healing in this way. Right. sit with what's going on yeah yeah we're doing it on individual levels i'm doing it in my work every day i show up but you know i'm affecting you know 10 20 100 people it's like how do we get this onto a larger scale where because i believe that the work that we're both talking about the work that we have experienced i believe right. that that work doesn't have the negative side effects <laughs> that you right. know a exactly. possible like welfare could have had you know yeah, yeah. but it's like how how do yeah. we do that well that's my life's work there that's what go. i feel called to do that's exactly what it is yeah yeah i hope you hurry up with it because i want to <laughs> sit in my lifetime as well. <laughs> i'm working as hard as i can yeah no <laughs> So I, I really, really appreciate you. I'm su- I'm super grateful that you were willing to do this. I know it's a, uh, it's just it's such a challenging time for everybody, and it can be really scary to be public with this. Um, like I'm not unaware of the fact that I sit here as a white man <laughs> talking to you as a black man, and like might I say something that someone might interpret and some way right yeah and i'm really grateful for this opportunity for us to connect uh because uh yeah it's like i know you and i know you're an incredible person and a part of me like looking at your social media got a bit nervous like like what yeah. is what yeah. what is going on and and i know that like what this part was this is a part who uh has experienced the victimhood and the stuff like that so mm-hmm. i was like we're going to talk to Calvin. We're going to remember. <laughs> right. You know, I really appreciate that you did that. I'm, I mean, I'm so, so thankful that you did that. Cause like that allowed me to, to hear and see and understand how I was being received, right? which okay. is not what I intended. You know, yeah. I think I got like, I got carried away with, with social media and liking to make fun of things and just be like, you know, in jest and, not being sensitive to the pain that's 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 out there and not showing that side of me that empathetic side right so like sometimes i jump into my engineering mind or my you know the other the other parts of me so i really appreciate that um thank you for doing that you're welcome yeah. i'd love to actually continue at some point um, of course, I think there's I'm, more stuff i'm down for it definitely i yeah i really believe that you are going to do major things on this planet. So anything that you're involved in, I would love to support you with in any way that I can. Thank so, you. of course. I love right. you, Lord. Love you, Helen. Thank you. All right, see you. All right, take care. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast episode. After 20 years as a serial spiritual entrepreneur, it's my passion to share lessons 
insights and ideas that I picked up along the way. So please subscribe and share if you found any value from today's conversation.